thank everybody for joining in in the chat and telling us where you're coming from. It's great to see people who are coming from across the state for our webinars. Uh, my name is Megan Lewis. I'm the public funding navigator for Arts Alliance Illinois. And I'm excited to have you all join us for day one of our Arts Alliance Help Desk Workshop series, Sustaining and Adapting Your Creative Nonprofit. And today's program is about a topic that many arts organizations have had to navigate due to the pandemic, which is building virtual capacity and in particular, a virtual finance office. Our program has been made possible with the support of the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. And the, it's designed to help the creative sector in Illinois get established, expand, and thrive. And you can check out recordings of our past webinars in the series on the Arts Alliance YouTube channel. And uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself to the panelists and your creatives, fellow creatives who are here today. If you'd like to share your name, your pronouns as you feel comfortable, where you live in your arts practice. And for those who need ASL interpretation, we do have two interpreters with us today. They should be spotlit on your screen, but if for some reason you can't see them and you need them, please use the three dots in the upper right of their video screen to pin them. So here's the plan for today's program. We're gonna hear from an expert from BDO FMA, Rebecca Kellogg, about best practices and tools that arts organizations can use to build an effective remote finance operation. We'll have some time at the end for Q&A, but you can also ask questions as the program is going on if something comes to you and we can we can address it in real time. But feel free to use the chat and the Q&A if you'd like to put your questions there, any reactions you have and more. We're really looking forward to the conversation we're gonna have today. Before we get into the presentation, I just want to take a couple of minutes to give you a quick overview of Arts Alliance Illinois, especially for those of you coming to our programming for the first time. So Arts Alliance is a statewide arts advocacy organization that works to build the creative sector's power through advocacy, policy change, research, and connection to needed resources to improve the quality of life of communities across Illinois. Our members and our network spans all art disciplines across the state. And best of all, our membership is pay what you can. There's a, a link that's being dropped into the chat if you would like to learn more about joining Arts Alliance as a member. We focus our work in four main areas. First is civic engagement that centers artists and the creative sector. We also do policy, organizing and structural change to help the creative sector advocate for its interests, research to collect and disseminate the data the sector needs for advocacy, case making and building public will, and resource navigation to help connect the sector to public funding dollars. From fighting for and winning COVID relief funding for the arts and culture sector to helping creatives navigate public funding for the arts, we're here to ensure the institutions and individuals in the arts and culture sector can thrive. And in particular, the Arts Alliance Help Desk is here to support you and connect you with resources. You can visit our site and start a chat with one of our staff members, check out our running list of funding opportunities on our website, and get that critical technical support that you need to successfully apply for public funding. We recognize that creatives in downstate Illinois and on the south and west sides of Chicago face disproportionate barriers to accessing the resources that they need. So we're here to connect you with the experts and Illinois' entire creative community to make sure that all of us can thrive. As mentioned today, our program is the last in our series we are holding this year to give you the resources you need to start, grow, and sustain your creative nonprofit and business. And again, a reminder that recordings of our past webinars are available on our YouTube channel, um, so check that out. We'd love for you to join us tomorrow which is our last day of this series focused on building operating reserves. While we split these webinars between for-profits and non-profits, there is something for everyone in all of our program. So without further ado, let me pass it on over to Rebecca. Take it away. Hi, thank you. Let me quickly share my screen. And... We'll get started. Uh, 
Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Rebecca Kellogg. I am here from BDO, our nonprofit and grant maker advisory team. And um, what we, you know, kind of as a team do is support kind of nonprofits and social service organizations and the, um, the funders that fund them. And so really focusing on operations and on finance. And today we're gonna to be focusing on adapting your finance office in a virtual world. So how do we go from um, lots of paper and um, manual processes to thinking about what technology solutions might be useful for us? I know you all just um, just kind of put your names and a little bit about yourselves in the chat. We um, have a, a poll here today. So just two questions quickly, just so I can kind of get a little bit of a sense of who is here, what are you know kind of in general, and what are we um, you know, kind of what are we hoping to learn? Um, and kind of about the size of your um, of your organization, just so that I can kind of tailor a little bit to um, to who's here. Whenever it feels like we have kind of a general consensus, feel free to close that poll. Okay. Thank you. So it looks like we have, you know, a good group of people that um, kind of spanning all sorts of reasons for coming, right? Some thinking about starting nonprofits, some recently joined one or founded one. Um, some are always here for a free webinar. I love that. And then a bunch of, you know, kind of a number of people are also here for, for other reasons. And, um, and hopefully you'll all get something out of this. Um, again, we also have a very a variety of budget sizes, so we will um, we'll work to address all of that um, and get started. A uh, little a quick intro about myself, since you all have been so great introducing yourselves both in the chat and through the poll. I am a director in our in BDO's New York office. So I sit here, I sit, well, I sit here in my attic today in Westchester, but um, I work um, closely with organizations and nonprofits all across the country. So while I sit in New York, I work across the country um, and I oversee, I do trainings like this and I oversee what we call our assessment service line. So um, anytime we are working with an organization to take a look at their current operations and making recommendations for how they might improve, um, either through efficiency or staffing or um, accuracy, any of those types of things. Um, I have been doing this work for over a decade and am just continuously inspired by the people I meet and the organizations I work with, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, overview of what we're going to be talking about today, um, that operations and equity is actually moved to the end. So, so this is a little out of order, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about kind of um, financial resilience, some accounting software, other um, software options. So we'll walk through kind of what's important in selection and implementation. Um, we'll talk about how equity fits in when you know you don't always think of equity when you think of technology, but it's really important. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some resources and some time for you all to ask questions. Um, as Megan had mentioned, if you have questions throughout, feel free to um, share them either in the chat or in the Q&A function. I'll, I'll stop a couple of times and just ask if there are questions, but, um, but in general, um, feel free to just kind of uh, ask when you when they come to you. Um, great. So if you have had a BDO webinar, you may have seen this slide before, but we generally kind of think about what, you know, kind of 
what does it take to be an organization that's financially resilient, that's really grounded in kind of the present, but um, working to plan for the future? And so that starts kind of at that at the center where we have our values. And so that's equity and inclusion, being mission focused, right? We all found are part of parts of nonprofits in order to um, because we have a mission that we're focused on. Um, continuously improving. So thinking about how do we use and, and data driven. So how do we use data um, and um, and sector knowledge and all of that to um, keep improving upon the way that we do what we do. Um, today, we're going to be focused kind of on that middle circle, just on the right side on operations. We're going to be thinking about, um, you know, what are the operational um, technologies that will help us to um, to be able to focus more on that mission. Okay, um, just a little definition of operations here. Um, we'll start at the top with people and teams. Uh, so we think of operations as, you know, how many people do we have on our teams? What do they do? How do we divide up the work? Um, for finance, that's really thinking, you know, segregation of duties and internal controls and who has, you know, kind of the expertise, um, whether it's technological or um, or accounting, to help us drive forward um, our finance operations. Um, then moving to the right, we have workflow. So how does information move from one person to the next? How do we ensure that our financial information is accurate and timely and helps other people make decisions? And so really thinking process, process, process. And then lastly, where we'll focus today is technology. How do we use technology to make our people and teams work more efficiently and, and to ease our workflow and process? We'll start with, um, with this diagram, really looking at all of the different software systems that can be a part of, um, of your finance function. And so you'll note that we put accounting and reporting software in the middle, which is where we're gonna start. Um, this is really our system of record. It is where all of our financial information is kept. And then the other software surrounding it really are providing information in order to, um, to make sure that that system of record is accurate and timely. Um, so let's dig in a little bit more. We'll start with accounting software and we'll dig into some of the others. Basic functionality that you'll want to find in an accounting system. Um, and that you will find in pretty much any accounting system that you have is, you know, we'll start with a flexible chart of accounts. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, you'll find modules for things like accounts payable and accounts receivable. So you're not necessarily entering journal entries for each um, transaction, but you have a module to say, okay, I got this bill. How do we, you know, kind of how does that fit? Um, reporting against budgets. So basic functionality, you can put a budget into the system and then report against it. So have a budget versus actual. Um, most of them have customizable reports. So you can decide what to include, what not to include, what do you, you know, kind of what do you want that report to look like? Um, the ability to import or export data. So, you know, kind of taking data from one place and putting it into your accounting system, being able to export it out to um, generally it's Excel, but you can also do PDF. But if you do it in Excel, then you can manipulate it, turn it into dashboards, do other things with it. Um, and then the last piece of basic functionality is um, the ability to have view only access for end users. So if you have people on your team who are managing budgets, but you don't but don't need access to change things in the accounting system, they should be able to. Um, to view kind of what's in there and run a report saying this is your budget versus your actual. Okay, so those are kind of the basic things. And then we have the things that make um, a accounting systems different. And specifically, some of these are, well, just the first one really specifically is for, um, for nonprofits. When you have uh, restricted funding, you want to be able to have fund accounting. And what that allows you to do is to say, if you get, you know, kind of um, a restricted grant that can only be spent on a certain program or within a certain time frame, you can mark it as restricted within your, um, within your accounting system. And then when you run the reports, you can see what's restricted and what's not. Um, so that's really helpful. 
um, especially as you kind of have to report to the government and, you know, the, to the IRS doing your 990s or have an audit once you get large enough to need to require an audit. Um, having that fund accounting is really, really helpful. It's also helpful for managing if you got a 10 year grant that, you know, it's, you get $100,000 every year for 10 years, you want to make sure that you know what's available for this year. So fund accounting is a huge differentiator. That is one that um, I know someone asked in the Q&A earlier about QuickBooks. QuickBooks does not have fund accounting, but there are there are ways to um, to manipulate it so that you can still see what you need to see. Um, so other differentiators are things like automated allocations. So if you have multiple programs and multiple kind of functions and you have some expenses that just need to like be allocated to each of those functions separately, um, you can set up an automated allocation. So you say every time we get the electricity bill, 20% goes here, 30% goes there, 50% goes there, and you and it does it automatically. You don't have to put that in every time. So that's automated allocations, um, cloud capability or web hosting. This is you know more and more common these days to be able to at least host it on, um, on a VPN server, but um, cloud capability also is helpful. Um, so that you can access access it anywhere. Paperless document management, what that is, is really routing um, approvals from one place to the next. So if you have every invoice needs to be approved before it's paid, it, you can have that routing as part of your accounting software. Um, dashboards, we'll talk more about these a little bit later, but dashboards are just um, reports in picture form so that it's easy to kind of see where do we stand against the target. Um, for those who like to look at things in kind of a picture form, um, electronic workflow routing, same um, same with paperless document management. Um, the workflow is where you'll do the approvals. Actually, the document management is where you'll be able to save um, your, your invoices, other documents, so that you don't have to also save them on paper. You don't also have to save them in a separate file. And then lastly, it's purchase requisitions. Is If you have a purchasing process that requires, you know, kind of... Um, um, a pre-approval, you can have that as part of your accounting system where somebody asks for approval, gets the approval within the accounting system, buys the thing, and it's all part of that. And so it automatically loads in. Okay, so those are kind of the basics and some of the differentiators. I mentioned we get back to the flexible chart of accounts. Um, so this is just, this is an example of QuickBooks chart of accounts. And as I kind of mentioned, you know, down here in the customer job area, you can see where you might be able to kind of put some restrictions in there. Um, but with a flexible chart of accounts, you, um, the chart of accounts itself is over here on the left, the assets, the liabilities, the net assets, the revenue and expenses. And you're able to define what goes into each of those categories, right? So you can put as many bank accounts in there as you have for assets, your liabilities, you put in the ones that you need to be able to track, your net assets, you have restrict, you can put restricted, unrestricted um, revenue. You can do foundation revenue. You can do government revenue. You can do individual. So you can basically, it's you just name out the things that make the most sense for your own business model. And that's very flexible. It's um, all of the accounting systems you'll, you'll find will have that. Um, and then on the right side, we have, and this is really kind of in QuickBooks language, but all software systems will have some way of doing this. Um, the class is, you know, the way that you can structure it so that you're able to, if you have to report on your 990, the functional expenses, right? So you have your program expenses, your management and general expenses, management and management in general expenses, and your fundraising expenses. Um, in three separate categories, you can have a subclass to say, oh, I have multiple programs, so we're putting that under. Um, and then if you need to track against the funders, right, a funder gives you a restricted grant, um, you can do that using what they call the customer and job function. So your customers are the people who are giving you money to do what you do, right? So if we think of it not necessarily as um, a customer, but a funder is giving you money to help you achieve your mission, your funders are your customers and they could give you multiple grants. So you, each grant would be um, what we call a job, okay? 
So that's kind of just a, digging a little bit more into um, what, you know, kind of the, th the ways that you might want to divide your accounting system so that you can um, get reports that help you make the decisions that you need to run your, um, your organization. Okay. Um, before we move out from the accounting and reporting software, I wanted to see if there are any questions currently. We don't have any questions sitting okay. in the QA or the chat right now. Okay, perfect. Um, great. So we started with accounting and reporting software again, because that is really kind of the hub of where you want to keep all of your information. But we do have options to have other types of software that will feed information, right? So these are the spokes of your um, of your finance functions that will feed information into your accounting and reporting software. Whether that is, you know, kind of more or less manual is really kind of decisions that you'll um, you'll be wanting to make and things that we'll be talking about today. So on the highly manual side is, you know, you get a I'm going to use an invoice as an example. You get an invoice in the mail, you open, somebody opens it, you write the coding on it, you manually enter it into um, any systems that it needs to be entered into. Um, if it's, in, if it has to be in, you know, kind of, it, it does have to be in your accounting system. If you're also entering it in, say like a bill paying system, um, you're entering those separately. So that's like the highly manual way of doing it. That ends up requiring um, you to make sure that you reconcile regularly because, you know, as you're manually typing numbers in, it's so easy to um, to accidentally hit a different, the wrong number, put the decimal in the wrong place. You want, it, it can be prone to error to continuously um, enter things manually. And so we want to make sure that um, we're reconciling regularly. Um, the set kind of in the middle category here, we kind of have two um, kind of middle of the road methods for um, for data flow between systems. The first one is entering batched totals. So let's say you deposit a bunch of checks in the bank, you total the deposit and enter the totals in to the accounting system and you number it by the batch. So you can always go back and look and make sure that, and, you know, again, reconcile and make sure that things match you're not necessarily entering every single check into your accounting system. Okay, so that's um, manually entering batched totals. Um, the second kind of middle of the road way is um, being able to download from one system. So if it's, you know, kind of your credit card, right? So you download the credit card information and then you upload it to your accounting system. It is a little bit less prone to error because you're not manipulating the data. You might have to manipulate the format, but, um, but you're not gonna ma manipulate the data, but it's kind of a download from one system and upload to the other. It's a two-step process. You might have to code in between. Um, and then the highly automated which is, you know, kind of the, um, you know, building a digital bridge where all of your systems are talking to each other. And so you um, specifically choose systems that are going to transfer information um, directly. So there isn't any human piece in the middle. Um, you'll still need humans for kind of coding things for, uh, you know, reviewing and making sure everything got in there and makes sense. But um, but it does leave, um, you know, kind of a lot of that human error out um, and it works its way to your accounting system automatically. Okay. So today we're going to talk about all of these different types of um, external software systems, right? So external to your accounting system and um, and talk about kind of what are the benefits of them? What are they? What might you um, consider? Before we even go into them, would love to hear in the chat, um, what are you currently using or of these technologies, what are you currently using or considering um, for your organizations? QuickBooks. The 
QuickBooks with payroll, bill.com, QuickBooks desktop. Great. EBT, Wave, <laughs> QuickBooks Online. Great, so it seems like we have a lot of people using QuickBooks, Kindful, ADP, um, a few using bill.com, which is a um, automated bill pay system. So you don't have to print and write your own checks. Um, we have budget planning and tracking, that's great. Um, QuickBooks Online, ADP, um, eTapestry, Principal, great, thank you. Um, so we'll talk about the generals of all of these, if anybody, as we're going, if anybody has any um, specific softwares for, as we're going through each of the, um, each of the types of technology, specific software that they love, I'm sure that your, um, your colleagues would also like to know that this is my favorite software ever, and I think you should consider it. So feel free to add those to the chat when, um, as we're going through, if you find ones that you particularly love and want to spread the spread the word to your colleagues. Um, great. So banking technology is one of the easiest technologies to implement. Um, you know, it starts with, you know, kind of electronic transfers. So instead of having to issue checks, you know, kind of cut the check, sign, you know, kind of find the person who needs to sign the check, make if you need two signatures, find the other person that needs to sign the check. Um, you can use um, banking like ACH technology to um, to pay some bills. Um, and then the, on the other side, so that's the payment side, the other side is kind of remote deposit. And so this is instead of, um, of bringing your checks to the bank, being able to take to receive a check and scan it directly into your bank account, I think, or, you know, kind of, I know personal bank accounts and some, um, and, and some business ones too, also still allow you to kind of do the picture with your phone, but really it's about being able to deposit remotely and not have to, having to kind of fill out that deposit, you know, the paper deposit sl slip, putting it in an envelope, bringing it to the bank. Um, on the controls side, so making sure that we're safeguarding our assets, um, there's two um, two main ways that your bank will offer. One is positive pay. Um, it ensures that you know, kind of, if you're writing checks, they're only paid to verified vendors. Oftentimes, you'll supply your bank with a list of you know, kind of, of vendors that you um, are regularly making payments to. You can send them a list on a monthly basis of the payments that you're making that month. If you want, you know, kind of, it's um, working with your bank to decide what is best for you, but being able to make sure that Anybody who's not on this list doesn't get a check. Or if they get a check, it won't be able to be deposited. Um, and then the second one is very similar, but it's for ACH payments it's called ACH block and filters. And again, this is working with your bank to say these are the verified or authorized um, vendors who are able to remove, uh, to kind of access and remove funds from my account. Um, and if they're not on that list, the bank won't let that money go out. Okay. So that's banking technology. Next we have expense management software. And I think that um, as organizations get larger and have more people making, uh, making purchases and more people using credit cards and, um, and all of that, this becomes one of those um, one of those technologies that is really, really useful. Um, and it all it does is, you know, kind of you have it can be tied to a credit card or it can be, or you can use it separately. Um, but it's based, it's web-based. A lot of them have mobile apps that you can use. Um, when you purchase something, you scan or take a picture of your receipt or any documentation that's needed. Um, and upload it, you code it to whatever program or administration or account, um, chart of accounts account um, that it belongs. And then you send it along for approval, right? So you say, okay, you know, whether it is, you know, kind of if it's um, an employee spending their own funds, they can be approved, you know, kind of to, to pay that out. But if it's just an invoice that needs to be, a, you know, kind of if it was um, a 
a corporate uh, credit card and it's an invoice that just needs to be paid it really goes in and says this is an this is a um an authorized expense we can you know kind of move that to the next stage and it does that all electronically so that those approvers are getting um a notification hey you have you know kind of an expense um to approve and and they don't have to kind of sit there and sign things um, and then it can also, you know, as I, I kind of mentioned this already, but it can directly connect to your credit card. So if you have a corporate credit card, you can have it automatically load um, as much information as possible into the system. And then the employee just needs to go in um, and code it and sometimes say, you know, what it's for if it, need, if it didn't kind of, if it can't pick that up um, from the type of expense. Um, it can connect directly to your payroll system. So if it is um, an employee paid expense, it can connect to your payroll system to pay that employee, to reimburse the employee for it. So that that goes out through payroll, it's again, saving you the, um, the headache of having to write a check. Um, and then it can connect directly to your accounting system. So especially if you've got it set up in you know, using your accounting system chart of accounts, using your accounting system codes for programs, um, et cetera, it can connect directly to your accounting system and just lo automatically load in. So that kind of makes it so we're not doing that manual data entry. And then that also leaves us with an electronic audit trail. So if you are audited, you can say, okay, here was the when the expense happened, here was when it was approved, um, here's when the payment went out and the payment was approved. All of that is electronic. Um, sometimes auditor auditors for this and for the um, what we'll get to next, the online bill pay, will ask for auditor access to it. So there's a way to give your auditor access and they can just do their testing. Um, by logging in to their auditor access and seeing the things that they need to see. Okay, so that's expense management. And then when it comes time to actually pay the check, right? We talked about the ACH for the bank, but you can also have, and I know a bunch of people said that they had it here, um, bill.com or other, there are other systems that do it as well. Bill is the um, probably the most well-known <laughs> system for um, online bill pay and automated check writing. Um, again, you can have the invoice approval workflow through there. And this is really invoice approval for, um, for payments. And it, it integrates with your accounting software. Um, bill.com I know works really well with QuickBooks um, and with some other accounting softwares as well. Um, you can have them write a paper check or send an electronic fund, send it via electronic funds. So if um, if they write a paper check, it they write it, they, it's signed, you know, kind of with the approval, and it is mailed on your behalf. And those who receive it will kind of um, see that it's from. It'll look like it's from your check stock. So not, I won't say necessarily look like it's from bill.com. Um, and it just really helps kind of eliminate some of the manual process of cutting and mailing checks. I know <clears throat> here in New York, we have had, um, there are certain areas where there are some challenges with the mail um, and kind of mailboxes and um, post offices, um, not, you know, kind of people put, you know, whitewashing checks and using them for things that they shouldn't use them for. And so this eliminates that. Um, so there's that in electronically archives um, and there's a simplified deposit process as well. Okay. You're flying. Okay. There are also, so that's money going out. Um, this is a alternate ways money can go out. So we talked about electronic um, payments through your bank. That's kind of that, um, that, Chase Pay, Zelly, those types of things. Um, and we talked about having, you know, writing checks. You could also um, use payment cards or P cards, sometimes called purchase cards. Um, these give you an added layer of control. So the, you could set them up to have a spending limit. So this card can only spend up to $1,000 or $500, whatever you want that spending limit to be. You can set them up so that they only work for certain types of expenses, right? So if it's 
you know, kind of used in a way of petty cash. It could be, you know, we use this for meals only, or we use it for meals and staples, or, you know, the types of expenses that you want um, to put on there. So you can put those types of restrictions. Um, so that's P cards. We have digital credit cards. So these are credit cards that are issued by the, um, the expense management systems. So there's, you know, Expensify has its own credit card, which is tied seamlessly, obviously, to their expense management system. Divi does the same thing. Those are just two examples of um, softwares that will do that. Um, and so you, and they really, the, um, the credit cards are for online purchases. So they don't send you kind of the plastic card um, to use places, but you can use them for online for Amazon for, you know, anything that's purchased online. Um, and it has that direct feed into your expense management software, which hopefully will also have a direct feed into your accounting system. And then there's mobile apps that we're all used to, PayPal, Venmo, the ability to pay people in those ways. Okay. Um, I know I saw in it that a lot of people were talking about different payroll systems um, that they're using. I saw a lot of ADP on there. Um, I saw somebody's looking for types of time and attendance systems. So if you have a time and attendance that you love, stick it in the chat. Um, and so really your payroll system is how do you pay your employees? And this is one of those um, I see Gusto in there. But this is one of those systems that we will recommend that is one of the first ones that you adopt, right? So you can do payroll through QuickBooks. You can do payroll um, by, you know, kind of manually by yourselves um, using kind of the QuickBooks application. It is really easy to... Um, to forget to do your quarterly account. Yeah, you can have an accountant to your payroll, perfect. Um, if, if you're not paying attention to it, you might forget to do your quarterly reporting. You might you know, miss out on some of the, the tax rules or overtime or any of that type of stuff. And so it is really, really helpful to have a payroll system. Um, once you get to a certain level of employees, you might wanna upgrade that to really a full HR management database. Um, and so whether it, it'll, you know, kind of have everything from onboarding to offboarding and every, and performance management and everything in between and include payroll. Um, and then a lot of us need to report on time and attendance. And so whether that is through your payroll system or with something that will speak to your payroll system, um, that, um, you know, kind of can be very important to have. Um, I know, you know, kind of all of the major payroll systems, ADP and Paychex um, and Paycom and all of those have some of the time and attendance systems. It's really just figuring out what um, works best for you and um, and what works best for your employees, um, whether that's, you know, kind of the, you need the fingerprint technology or the eyeball scans, or if it's just a, cl a, a clock in and clock out, um, those types of things. Um, we do want to make sure, you know, kind of we have there that triangle, the integrated platform. If you have time and attendance and an HR database and a payroll system, you want to make sure that that's really um, on platforms that work to, that at least work together, but oftentimes it's just one single platform. Um, we have that travel and expense system kind of below payroll talking about, um, you know, kind of that's really for um as I talked about on, on a previous slide, that's for when we're paying expenses out to employees who paid out of pocket. Um, being able to hook that up to your payroll system is really helpful to not have one additional check to cut. Um, so that's really great. And then you see there's all of the arrows headed straight into the accounting database. We want those pay that payroll system to be able to work with your accounting system and to be able to get information um, direct ideally it's directly into your accounting system. A lot of times it ends up being a download from the payroll system and upload into the accounting system, um, which as long as there isn't as much, you know, too, too much manipulation, that shouldn't be a problem. And I think most of the people on this call have, um, you know, kind of small 
organizations where you that may just be um, easy to facilitate. Um, I did see one question in the chat. Wanted to um, to address that. Does Bill.com include payroll, or does it work in cooperation with another system like Gusto? Um, I believe Bill.com does not have payroll. Um, but I would defer to anybody on the call who might be using Bill. Um, but I believe bill.com is really meant for um, your non-payroll expenses. Yeah, thank you, Kayla. I feel like they're one of these days are going to expand to include payroll and I'm gonna miss it, but, um, but at this time, no. Yep, it works best for contractors and vendors, I would agree. And with bill.com, and I think some of the other ones like that, um, you, your contractors and vendors can send their invoices directly to, um, to an email address at bill.com so that it just automatically goes in. Okay, that was time and attendance. And now we can get to talk about the money coming in, right? So technologies that facilitate Fundraising are things, um, you know, kind of you want to think about um, a fundraising platform or a CRM, which is customer relationship management technology. Um, some of the common ones are um, Little Green Light or Razor's Edge, or the, there's so many of them that I, I can't get them all straight. But really, what this does is it's, it enables you to have a place where all of your um, all of the people who give you money are housed there. And then if you have marketing that you want to go out to them, if you have an annual appeal, it's all there. Um, it also um, helps you keep track of, you know, kind of how much you have fundraised and you're able to um, reconcile that with your accounting database. So making sure that everything matches. So that's really that fundraising platform, customer relationship management. It can ping you when, you know, to make sure that you're sending the acknowledgement letters when you're when you need to and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I say give.com on the website. Yep. Um, you can start allowing donations via text message. And we see this often for organizations that are having kind of an annual event or something. And you know, we'll have a big sign up or a QR code even that just says, you know, kind of like text this number with your um with your with your bid or some or things like that. Um, and you can do those donations via text message. Um, your mobile bidding at auctions. Oftentimes if you have if you have an annual event um, and you have an auction at your annual event, um, people could put their bids in via phone instead of having the little paddles to raise. Um, might not be as fun as the paddles, but um, but it does kind of allow people to kind of um, enter the auction remotely. So that, um, that if they can't be there in person, they can um, make sure to be part of your auction. Um, and then the last thing under facilitation of fundraising is mobile payment solutions. So just being able to, you know, kind of if you have, um, um, if you are accepting money, whether it is for kind of a workshop or tuition or, for um, an event or for um, donations, if you can use things like Square and Stripe um, that are really kind of low cost ways to have, to allow people to pay via credit card. Um, we do have a question and I, and I believe it's for the group. So has anyone had success using the same platform for, for courses, workshops and tuition and donations. That's tough because it's different types of revenue coming in, right? So can we pay for your course workshop tuition and also um, track donations? I'd love to hear from the crowd. Andrea says Square can work for that. And neon CRM, yep. Cool. Perfect, so it sounds like Square might be a good option. Neon might be a good option. I'll let you all keep um, 
keep going in there. WooCommerce, I haven't heard of that. Oh, I have heard of that one, but I've never used it. Um, okay. Our next um, type of software solution is, that we're seeing a lot more kind of technology solutions for is um, budget modules um, and allowing scenario planning um, to be automated. And that's a really kind of a, a neat thing. Um, many of us are used to kind of building things and, you know, kind of pulling things out of the accounting system and putting them into Excel and manipulating that in a way that makes the most sense for budgeting for next year. And, um, and then, you know, kind of working with people to update their budgets and then having, you know, kind of having worked in finance, you know, it is the finance team that's taking despair, you know, if you have different um, department leaders who are creating budgets, and then you have to take them all and put them into a single one, um, and consolidate it and make sure that you are not double counting expenses, and you're not leaving things out. Um, so consolidating that and, um, and then presenting it and all of that. So um, there's a lot of, and then when you think about scenario planning, that just adds a whole nother layer on there. So there is a lot of, um, of, of movement around kind of being able to do collaborative budgeting and scenario planning using technology. And this is, you know, kind of, you can still see kind of within these process, there's, a you know, kind of, there's needs to be some kind of human collaboration. There needs to be a setting of priorities and a determination of what do we think we, the rest of our, you know, kind of what do we think our activities are going to be next year? What do we think they're going to look like? How much do we think we're going to spend on X, Y, and Z? Um, so thinking about kind of what are our priorities for the next year, putting those into, you know, kind of a number format, um, consolidating, collaborating again to, um, to really kind of finalize. So you'll see kind of in this illustration, um, the automation of budgeting and scenario planning is going to help kind of alleviate some of those pressure points and bottlenecks. Um, so, you know, kind of that first part where we are automating kind of your prior year actuals and preparing and distributing budget templates that can easily be done in a budgeting software um, to kind of pull from your accounting software, you know, kind of as you've got that set up with your flexible chart of accounts, we'll pull from the accounting software to get your prior year actuals your um, kind of current year to date actuals oftentimes, um, and then preparing budget templates um, can be set up once in the system and then, and then they, um, they, it can make it easier for kind of future years and for multiple program areas as well. Um, so then again, um, so that's the automated portion, right? All of that can be come together automated. Um, it can be, you know, kind of all of that managed through the cloud. And then we kind of have that moment of collaboration, right? So the department heads are completing their templates, discussing with finance, maybe discussing with leadership um, and really kind of figuring out what the next year looks like. And then we go back to the automated part, right? So they've they've put that budget, the department heads have put all of their budgets into the system. And now the system will do that consolidation um, it'll put it next to prior year actuals. It'll put it next to current year to date and maybe some for it can also do some forecasting for you, um, any budget variances for the current year. So that's going to be automated. And then we come back together and collaborate again, right? So we take what's in the system. We have finance, we have department heads, and we have senior management all refining their budgets, doing some scenario analysis, right? So what what would happen if we get XYZ grant that we think we might get, but we're not quite sure? Or what would happen if that money that we were counting on doesn't come through? Um, what would happen, you know, kind of, so it's it's all of those what ifs and being able to say, well, you know, here's, you know, the, the lever by which the time and the, um, and, you know, kind of the information that we need in order to say, we're going this way or we're going that way and creating those different scenarios. And so all of that kind of has to be thought through, but can can be put into um, your budget template. So it's if you hit those marks, it can kind of 
you know, kind of ping you and, and be like, this is where we are. And this is where we, you know, kind of, this is, it's your time. It's time to make a decision on which scenario we're headed towards. Um, so that's kind of that collaboration piece. Um, and then again, your senior management, your board is going to approve. Once approved, we go back to the automation, right? So that budget, you know, we click approve in the budgeting software, the budget is uploaded into the accounting system um, for monthly reporting. Hopefully we've budgeted kind of on a monthly basis so that we know, um, but it'll be uploaded to the um, accounting software. Um, you can have budgeting software do your forecasting for you and say, um, you know, here's <laughs> what software does this. Um, there are a couple of different budgeting softwares. Um, Tableau will do it. Um, there's one that starts with an A and I cannot remember the name of it right now. Um, but there's a couple of different ones. Um, and I will caveat this with separate budgeting software is oftentimes actually one of the more expensive softwares to invest in. So keep that in mind, um, especially if you want them to do a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, so they can automatically forecast for you um, based on current, based on kind of your current spending or current results and say, if you continue in this way, that's what that will look like. Um, okay, that's the budgeting um, and scenario planning. Um, again, this is one of the more expensive ones to invest in. I think there are, um, there, somebody was telling me what, about one, I think it's Zena, Z-E-N-A, um, that is, you know, kind of not as, you know, kind of prohibitively expensive. So might be one to look at. I, it's not Albert and I cannot remember what the, I'm not going to remember the, but the other one that starts with an A right now, <laughs> but if it does come to me, I'll tell you, um, the, um, but yeah, so some of those, so some of them aren't as um, prohibitively expensive, but um, but I would say that's um, something to definitely check on. Um, and we have dashboard technology. So this is um, once you have all of your information in all of these systems that we've been talking about, how do you want to kind of see your results? Right. And there's really kind of three levels of this. So you have your Microsoft Excel, Google products. Um, and so you're able to kind of, you know, this is a great low cost option. You might need somebody who's able to kind of manipulate data to kind of create the charts and things that you know, um, that you need and that you want to see. Um, spend some time thinking for any of these, you want to spend some time thinking through what are the key perf performance indicators that we want um, to be measuring, right? So obviously there's always kind of budget versus actual, but are we also looking at, I know tomorrow you have a webinar on reserves. So are we looking at um, where we are against building our reserves? Are we looking at um, any program related data, any of those types of things? Um, and you can do things in graphs and in tables. Um, Excel and Google, uh, Google Sheets are, you know, kind of a great way to be able to do that. Sometimes you need someone who's going to be able to um, to build them. Um, the one they don't often, without some soft other type of software on top of them, it's really hard to have things kind of directly feed. So you might do some cutting and pasting each month from you know, kind of your data source to Excel or Google Sheets, um, which can you know kind of sometimes break them a little bit, but. Um, but this is a really great way to kind of get into that dashboard reporting. Um, we see this a lot being used a lot um, for building uh, reports for the board. So the board can kind of see against um, where you are against targets. Um, okay, so that's the first Excel and Google. Um, then we have many, many of your software systems will have um, some data tracking and the ability to create dashboards or even they might just automatically create dashboards for you. Um, so this, the dashboards will come built in. Um, the limitations with this is, you know, unless you're adding extra data, I know for things like, um, like Sage Intact, you can, you can build in data from other system or you can add in data from other systems, but unless you're building, adding data from other systems, the data is gonna be limited to the system that you're using. So if you wanted to see your program data next to your financial data or somehow combine those to say like 
how much does this cost per person uh, or per, you know, kind of per client or per um, participant, um, you would need to make sure that you're pulling that information in, you might have to do some manipulation. Um, but oftentimes, so that's, um, but, the, but the other limitation of those ones within your current data tracking systems might be that, so it's, um, it could be uh, specific to the system you're using. Um, it can be limited in flexibility. So some of them have dashboard um, capability, but they've you know kind of already designed them with standard reports or KPIs and you're not able to customize as much. Um, this is changing a little bit, but um, but you can um, see that sometimes. Um, and then the last category of dashboard technology is really business intelligence or specific dashboard software. Um, so I mentioned Tableau is a budgeting software. They also do dashboards. Um, these reports are often really highly flexi flexible, customizable. <clears throat> you can set up automatic feeds from multiple software systems into there so that you can do that analysis that you want. Um, limitations again for these might that that they can be expensive um, and oftentimes you need kind of a power user who's able to build the reports that you need um, as part of it or kind of a consultant co to come in to kind of set it up for you the, at, um, at the beginning okay <clears throat> so we've been through accounting software banking software expense management online bill pay alternative pay options payroll fundraising budgeting dashboards um any thoughts or questions before we talk about you know like what do we do next where do, how do we think about these Well, there's one question that's been mm -hmm. hanging out. I don't know if you're going to be suggesting any mm -hmm. particular accounting software above another. <laughs> um, so we do, we have three accounting softwares. I mean, so really it is about getting the accounting software that is right for your organization. Sometimes we will do, you know, kind of software selection projects with um, with organizations to say like, for your size, the complexity, the things that you need to be able to do. Um, let's look at these three softwares. We have three listed up here, kind of um, it's Sage Intact, um, Avila, Avila Financial Edge. Um, obviously QuickBooks is a really great software to start with. Um, FundEasy we sometimes see. It, FundEasy is funny to talk about in this particular workshop because it doesn't actually do any connections to any other softwares, there's a lot of, you can do a lot of downloads and uploads, but um, but no direct connections. Um, let's see, what are some of the others? Financial Edge, Financial Edge speaks with Razor's Edge. So if you are a Razor's Edge org, sometimes that's, um, that's a, a deal breaker. Um, NetSuite, so there's a bunch of different ones and it really is dependent on what you're using it for. I would say for, I mean, I think I remember, um, during that poll at the beginning for organizations that, you know, I, I think most of the organizations said they were under a million dollars budget, I would probably stick with QuickBooks um, if you have that, but I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> I don't sell QuickBooks. I'm not really, you know, I have no stop, um, no stake in the game, but um, but I feel like for smaller organizations, it is um, it does everything that you need it to do, and there are ways to track restricted funding through um, through kind of the way that you set up your chart of accounts that um, can do everything that you need. Okay. All right. So now we've been through all these, we're thinking, okay, well, what, how do I, this actually goes kind of into it a little bit, but like, how do I know what is right for me? How do I select technology? How do I implement it? What are the things that I need to make sure I'm looking at, right? So if you are, so I would say first, um, if you're thinking of changing your accounting software or you're thinking of implementing some technology, you want to make sure you're looking at 
you know, kind of you're looking at multiple, right? So I just said QuickBooks is great for all of you. That was a really sweeping, um, a sweeping statement. And I don't know the intricacies of any of your accounting. And so you might want to say, let's look at QuickBooks. Let's also look at <clears throat> at zero. Let's also look at intact. Let's see, the, you know, what are the differences between these? Um, and, um, and so you want to make sure you're looking at multiple. You want to, um, in, as with any change management activity, you want to make sure you're involving the people who will be most affected by it. So that goes for your accounting software. Obviously, you want your finance people included. You want to know, you know, kind of those who are receiving reports, what are the kind of reports that they want to receive, right? The end users um, for expense management software. That is the one big one that tends to affect a lot of people at an organization. And um, and so that one, you really want to make sure that you're you're getting something that's going to be easy to use for, for the staff that you have. Um, so you want to just make sure that you're understanding what's important to the people who are going to be using it, what would make their jobs easier, who are the stakeholders, how are you planning on communicating the change. Um, a big thing to do that gets to what's kind of on the screen here is doing a needs assessment. So knowing what are your priorities. So here we have kind of things that across the board you're going to want to look at, but you may have specific priorities within, you know, the type of technology that you're planning to implement that you want to really um, bring forward as you're comparing different systems. But some of the things you want to be really looking at is connectivity, right? Does the software that you're looking at connect with some software that you already have or other software systems you might be thinking about? Um, structure, are you able to, you know, as I showed that flexible chart of accounts um, earlier, are you able to set it up in a way that you can get the information that you need? Or that's an accounting software question, or for something that's not accounting software, can you set it up so that it'll feed into your accounting software in a, in a structure in a way that makes sense so that you're not recoding things all of the time? Does it offer the level of security you need? Thanks, thanks Andrea. Um, does it offer the level of security that you need, right? So what kind of protection, uh, data protection does it have? Um, what kind of information are you going to be keeping in it? Um, how, you know, for things like the automated check writing, stuff like that, are we, you know, kind of, are there controls in place to make sure that you're not automatically writing checks for somebody else, right? Um, so security, ease of use, can, you know, any software can be great, but we want to be, we want the one that we're going to be able to use most easily and that it's going to make sense. Um, and then what is the level of customization that's needed to make it work for your organization? So you may, you know, have some out of the box technology that works great. You may have some that you actually need to hire a consultant to help you install and, and get it customized for your organization. And so all of those are things that you want to be thinking about when you're implementing. Um, the last thing I would add to this, um, and this isn't necessarily for like the technology itself, but just as you're thinking about implementation, um, think about the timing of it, right? So what would be, you know, kind of when would be the most disrupted for your team and the least disrupted to you and your staff, right? So we you know, kind of maybe we don't want to test a brand new donation software at your annual gala. Maybe we don't want to switch your accounting software, you know, two months before the end of your fiscal year without kind of running a dual, like without finishing the fiscal year on the first software, right? Um, so just really thinking about what is the timing of implementing and um, and how, do I have the, um, you know, kind of the staff who are able to kind of support and champion and project manage and implementation, okay? Don't forget you have to train staff to use it too. So there's all of these things that go into it. And, you know, kind of there are, it is sometimes harder before it's easier, right? So getting used to the new way of doing things is going to be a little bit tricky. And then once you're there, it's the new normal. So it's kind of just making sure that you're making time for that kind of change management piece. Um, and then I promise we talk about this and this is super important because I think that um, 
not, you know, technology can often seem just kind of like a support system, um, transactional, and it's, it's, it can be really easy not to be thinking about equity, um, but I think that would be a mistake. So we have um, N10, which is one of the resources and kind of on the resources page, but it's a website that talks about um, it's nonprofit technology, and then there's an E and an N, and I can't remember what they stand for, but it's specific to nonprofit technology. It's a website, and they do all sorts of white papers and things. And one of the papers that they wrote is about technology and equity. I would recommend reading the whole thing, but we took out some highlights for you here. Um, so just using technology to help support staff equity. So you can think of that as, you know, um, equitable equipment policy. So you don't have a policy for, you know, BYOD, right? Bring your own device. We're issuing technology when we're requiring people to use it. Um, and standard equipment is tiered by who needs it, not necessarily by hierarchy. So it's kind of that equitable equipment policies. Um, if you're, if you are allowing remote work or if staff are expected to work remotely, we're making sure that they can do it, right? So we're providing um, stipends for cell phones, internet, home office equipment, those types of things if we're requiring or expecting them to work remotely. Um, if, um, if this is also the case, we have defined policies about remote work. So making sure that, um, that the, the remote work policy is clear, who's allowed to do it, how and why, how often, and then as leaders, we're leading by example, we are sticking to what those policies are. That's the remote work side. Um, we're centering equity in data policies and practices. So that's things like just being transparent and intentional about how we're collecting, storing and sharing um, data. So making sure that we're, you know, kind of only collecting data as needed. We're minimizing kind of data that we're extracting from our um, participants, from our staff, and we're protecting any data that is stored. Um, and just, we're just gonna remember that data cannot represent the full nuance of our service delivery. So we can measure and measure and measure and measure, but we wanna make sure that we're still paying attention to the nuances of service delivery um, and being careful about how we are using data to make decisions. Um, so flavor it with kind of the nuance as well. Um, and then we're not, so kind of promoting equity in technology selection and, um, and implementation, we're not going to be assuming um, that everyone has technical expertise. Um, if possible, we're, we're creating plans to develop some tech skills on the job. We're investing in training, making sure that we're professionally developing our staff. Um, we're making technology and training accessible. So if, you know, kind of making, um, you know, kind of auditory, physical, visual, physical disabilities in, in being inclusive in how we do our trainings, um, languages, supporting different learning styles. Um, we're building inclusive teams. So um, I mentioned on the last slide, it helps to include our stakeholders and who, you know, kind of in the, um, in the selection of technology. Um, so we're including the staff across the organization in technology planning, especially those who are expected to use it the most. Um, and so these are just kind of a few of the things that we pulled out of, um, of the article. But again, I would recommend reading the whole thing. They had a lot of kind of good examples in there, a lot to think about. Um, and then how do you choose what to do first? Right. So just of what we spoke about today, generally the low hanging fruit, the easiest thing to do is to do your um, to, to work with your bank to in install some of that banking technology, whether it's um, just paying by ACH or doing the remote deposits. That's just the kind of the easiest thing. And then after that, I would say prioritize the inflows and outflows of money. So. Um, you know, things like the auto, online bill pay, automated check writing, expense management, alternative payment options. Uh, we didn't talk about the accounts receivable workflow, but that's something that can also be automated and is another easy one to kind of put into um, put into place. A lot of times that's through your, um, um, it's relevant for those who kind of do a lot of billing and don't have a separate billing system. So um, if that's a 
pain point, you can use um, systems like build.com that do AP can also do things like AR. Um, and then um, from after the inflows and outflows, we look at kind of if you have a lot of hourly or part-time employees or a need to report on um, hours worked, uh, then the time and attendance systems are really important as well. Um, we have a couple of resources I wanted to go through, but before we get to those, um, any thoughts or questions? We do have um, a question where someone's asking if you can say more about how to, how best to assess compatibility of different softwares and platforms. Mm -hmm. The person says they're not highly tech savvy and often have challenges with figuring out workarounds when different softwares don't integrate with each other which I think a lot of us have experienced. Mm -hmm. So any tips or advice that you have for them? So I, I mean, the biggest tip or advice is when you are choosing software to choose systems that work well together. And that is, you know, a question you can ask when you are doing a demo or, um, or speaking to kind of a representative at the software um, uh, software company. So that's kind of the, the first way. The second way I would say is, um, is really doing as much kind of download from one system and upload into another. Um, sometimes the customer service at some of these places can help with, um, with, you know, I think, ADP is a big one that people are always like, I can't get my payroll into my accounting system without doing a lot of work. Um, and sometimes you can talk to um, a, a, a customer service representative to say, hey, this is what I'm trying to get it to do. How do I do that? So I would say use the customer service, especially some of these systems have customer service that um, you are either paying for as part of your subscription or um, or just have you know kind of free access to so would would um, would use that as much as possible as well. That's all we have that's sitting in the Q and A right okay. now. Great. So folks, we definitely have time set aside. This is your chance. Those <laughs> burning questions you wanted to ask about these platforms. Yeah. And I did, as, as people are formulating those burning questions, um, we are going to be sending um, out afterwards the um, two resources that can be helpful to really determine kind of, is it time for me to do this, to implement this type of a software, right? So you see kind of here is a software assessment. Um, and this is, you know, kind of the, the first one on here is, you know, the ERP or the accounting system. And it's like, are you, it asks you all these questions and then you click yes or no, you add up the, the yeses. And then, you know, kind of at the end, there's kind of a scorecard and you can say, oh, this is, um, this is the way that we, um, it, or this is a, a system that might be good for us to implement right now. I see your question, Jacqueline, give me one second. The second um, resource that, um, that we have is a technology solution implementation plan. And so this is once you've kind of started your technology, you know, kind of started down the technology journey, you, uh, it's a bunch of questions to ask as you're like really selecting and implementing. Um, so Jacqueline asked, can you speak a little bit more about fund accounting and QuickBooks online? We use the class function already, but it sounds like some other features were mentioned. Um, Wow. We do a whole training on this, so I will try to minimize it, but there is a way to set uh, there. You're all, there is always going to be some manipulation out of the system when you're trying to do fund accounting in QuickBooks because it's not built for that. But um, there is a way to set up your chart of accounts. So you have um, restricted revenue accounts and you have um and so you can kind of have those and you have them feed and then you set up your uh, your balance sheet accounts. So you have um, restricted net assets and net, net assets with restriction, net assets without restriction. And you there's a way to kind of 
it, 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 it makes it really complicated to explain in like two minutes, but, but there's a way to have it feed um, to close the restricted funds into that um, restricted net assets account. Um, a really quick, really quick way. And I was trying to remember, we might have, I would ask you to go to um, www.strongnonprofits.org. And that on that, I think, and I'm not sure, I'm trying to remember if we have it on there, but we have, um, but there might be a like working with QuickBooks and nonprofits like article on there. Um, and then do most nonprofits use GAP or management accounting? throughout the year, we would recommend if possible using um, using GAP throughout the year because that just makes the end of, you know, kind of closing everything at the end of the year really um, helpful and less onerous. We, we do have a question in the yep. Q&A uh, mm -hmm. wondering what are some measures or outcomes to look for to know that you're using the best software for your organization? Yeah, I think that what happens oftentimes is we don't know that we're not like that software is not working for us until we know that it's not working for us, <laughs> right? It's it's when you hit those but when you start hitting bottlenecks, when you hit start hitting pain points, and people start complaining about the software, it's when you know it's not working. Um, but I would say um, if you start noticing. Like, I think a bottleneck is a good way to think about it, right? If there's a place where data just gets stuck, um, that's one thing to think about. Um, oftentimes it's like, if you're doing things and you're and you're having to do a lot of manipulation outside of the system, it might be time to either look at how you have it set up. Are you using all of the functionality of the system that you already have? And is it time to explore other systems? Well, we don't have any other questions sitting in the Q&A or in the chat. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up this presentation. So uh, do you have a conclusion for us, Rebecca? <laughs> Looks like. Um, yeah, I have two slides, two, two last slides. One is just we talked about N10. Um, they have lots of, you know, kind of resources, education. This is kind of a snapshot of that equity um, in technology. Um, white paper that they have. Um, Tech Impact is another place that has, you know, specific to nonprofit technology and they do trainings and things like that. Um, and then TechSoup um, is another website that offers um, discounted technology solutions for nonprofits. And so um, kind of getting the best bang for your buck um, is a good place to go for that as well. And then lastly, I just mentioned this, so I won't go too far in depth, but we do have a toolkit um, that's, um, you know, cure, we um, we at BDO curated, but it's on the Wallace Foundation website. Um, we've worked with them to really pull um, financial management resources together in one place. And it, you can get there at strongnonprofits.org, um, or you can go to the Wallace Foundation's website and click on resources. But um, you can see it kind of goes all through all through kind of budgeting, cash flow, operations, which is where we were today, uh, data and analysis, getting ready for an audit, governance. So it has all sorts of um, free, I should say that out loud, free tools and resources. And um, so it's articles, it has Excel um, templates on there. It's got um, uh, all sorts of stuff that can be really helpful, checklists, all sorts of things. Um, so thank you so much, all of you for attending today. Um, really happy to see you, to see you all at least on chat. And, um, and I hope that you all found this helpful. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. This was a, a great presentation. I could tell from the comments in the chat, everyone was really getting a lot out of it. So um, thanks everybody for spending your morning with us. So as we conclude, we're gonna drop a few links into the chat. The first link is the registration link for tomorrow's program. This is the last webinar of the series that we started back in April. So hoping that folks can join us for our very last day. Um, we are looking for your feedback. We've done uh, these webinars now, like I said, since April. So we really want to get a sense of 
if we've provided the information you're looking for, what you'd like to your future programming to cover. So if you can fill out that jot form link, that would be really helpful to us. Uh, a few people did ask, and just to reiterate, the recording of this program will be on our YouTube page. Um, we will probably get up there by the end of the week. And again, you can also see all of our past programming there as well. And um, the Arts Alliance is a member organization. So if you liked this program, if you felt it provided you with some benefits, some professional development, uh, we would really love to have you join us as a member if you haven't already. So there's a link in the chat, artsalliance.org slash membership slash join. And then um, if you do still have some burning questions or ones that pop up after this, because I think we covered an awful lot of information, uh, you can go ahead and reach out to us in our help desk and you can contact us at artsalliance.org slash support and you can send an email and uh, spoiler alert, I'm the one who will be getting your email. So I look forward to hearing from you and uh, helping you out. So you can also stay on top of all of our help desk offerings that we're gonna have by signing up for the Arts Alliance newsletter. And you can do that at artsalliance.org slash sign dash up. I promise that's the last link I'm gonna be sharing. So, uh, but I do hope to see you all at a future help desk program. Thank you again for being here, and we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye-bye.